Hi friends, I am Dr. Ganguly. Welcome to my channel. Today I am going to discuss how to prepare for a typical MTech interview. And very often you may have to go to some interview for admission to master's degree programs in many universities. And essentially there is some pre-screening here. Maybe you have been screened through some testing and now you have to go to this particular interview. So I will list five points which are critical and then at the end I am going to discuss a bonus point which is very important. So let's start with the first point. So the number one issue is you should study the fundamentals. Now there are often a question as to what are the questions which are likely to be asked during the interview. So one thing to keep in mind is that most of the professors don't prepare for this interview. They don't carry with them a lot of book or lecture notes and so on. They come to these places essentially by themselves. Maybe some of them may have a page or something like that. So they are going to ask you very fundamental questions. And essentially this is going to come from the first year and second year of your curriculum. And sometimes in fact the best questions come from physics at the class 12 level. So essentially whatever you have studied in high school physics or intermediate physics, these aspects as related to your field are very important. So I would say one of the best strategies to go through the first few chapters of your key books or at least if you are able to have the time go through the entire books at this point. Also look at your physics book which you studied before you entered into college and go through the aspects of these physics books which are related to your discipline. So for example, if you are in a mechanical type of field, you should know basic things such as what is pendulum motion, what is Hooke's law, what is simple harmonic motion, what is spring mass tamper system and so on, what is wave motion. If you are in a electrical type of field, you should know some of the basics about circuits. So what are the RLC circuits? What are electromagnetic fields? What are magnetic fields? All these aspects, what is flux and so on. So these are important things to know because many of the questions which are asked have their roots somewhere in physics. So whatever be your field in the science or technology domain, you can go to physics and check out the problems. So that was the first point study the fundamentals. Now the second point. Now the second point is that you should remember the books you have studied throughout your curriculum for the bachelor's degree. Now many professors like to ask you what book did you study fluid mechanics from? What book did you study electrical circuits from? What book did you study database from? So you need to know these books. So very often students forget the names of the books, the people who write them and so on. And generally the feeling among professors is that if this guy doesn't even know the name of the book which he has studied, then of course he has no real passion or interest in the subject and is just doing it superficially to get the degree. So remember that second point. Now the third point. Now many people have got used to various multiple choice questions. So whether you take exams like the GATE or the GRE, these are all given in multiple choice question format. And one of the tricks about doing these exams is to figure out which is the most likely answer and to correct this answer or to choose this as the correct answer. The second point is that you can actually prepare for the exam with this thing in mind that you can leave out certain sections or leave out certain type of questions. And this is not going to significantly impact your score. So these are some of the strategies which you prepare for an exam. But then when you actually go for an interview type of situation, these can backfire on you. So for example, now you are facing a subjective type of question. So any question you are asked, there is no option now to leave this question or to quit this question. And you cannot also just guess the best answer because no answer is being provided to you. You have to actually solve this problem. So this is very much like a typical test which you give in your college. And so very often you are going to be asked a basic subjective type of question or you are going to be asked to solve a particular numerical and you need to solve it there. Now one of the things you cannot do here is you can say things like can I have a different question or I cannot solve this question because this reflects to this interview panel 
that you really do not have the tenacity and the willpower and the stubbornness to pursue with any given research problem. So this again becomes a big weakness in terms of the candidate. So whenever people are interviewing a candidate, they want to see this candidate give their 110% to the question. And if after giving 110%, they are not able to solve the question, that is fine. But essentially, just like in any subjective exam which you gave in your college or high school, you get scores or marks based on how much of the questions you have finished. So you don't have to answer the question correctly as a one zero answer like you do in multiple choice. But here you may have done 60% of the question or 80% of the question and the person who is testing you is trying to figure out your thought process. They are actually observing how you are going about solving this problem. And this often gives a lot of insight into the student's preparation, the student's thinking process and the student's knowledge of fundamentals. So that's the third point. Now the fourth point is to know basic math. And this is so important that it is something you should just keep in your mind. In fact, most of the people stumble on basic math and this is because mathematics is the language of most of the science and technology domains and in fact even in business management and social sciences. So you need to know the basic math. Certainly again I would recommend to you know the high school math very well. So if somebody gives you a very simple question related to the angles of the triangle, should they sum to 180 degree or they can give you some question based on plotting some function or finding the integral or derivative of some function and if you cannot answer these questions it looks very bad to the committee. Secondarily you move on to more college type of mathematics such as nonlinear equations, root finding, simultaneous equations, matrices, rank of matrices, how to solve quadratics, how to solve uh, basic differential equations and so on. And in matrix theory typically people love the eigenvalues and related properties. So these are some things to keep in mind. Now here also try to figure out the fundamental approaches to solve this problem. So sometimes there are students who just come and they use a method to just solve a differential equation and they say oh this equation is just solved like that. Now people do not want to see such canned methods being used. They actually want to see you do some thinking. So if you are putting some particular substitution into a differential equation and say let's assume this as the solution and then I solved it, they may ask you why did you take this as the solution. So if you put x is e to the power st, why did you particularly choose this exponential as a solution here? What led you to this? So again you need to think about some of these aspects as to why you are doing what you are doing. That's one of the key ingredients people are trying to test you for. So again, in this case, like I suggested, look at your high school mathematics and certainly whatever engineering mathematics you have studied or mathematics for science you have studied, go through these books and look at the fundamental aspects here. Now, if you do not answer a question on some partial differential equation or group theory or graph theory, people may not mind so much. But if you are not able to plot simple functions and if you are not able to do simple simultaneous equations or quadratic equations, that's going to reflect very badly on you. So remember, this is not like a multiple choice exam here. Here, you may answer five questions, but if you do not answer the most fundamental question, the committee is going to have a negative impression. Now, finally, the fifth point, and this is that whatever your score in your previous college days or whatever your score in your exam, maybe you have given GATE and cracked it, you are a topper in GATE, maybe you gave GRE and you are a very big expert in GRE. Don't let these things come out into this interview because one of the things you want to know is that this interview is totally independent of these things. They have selected you based on some of these things. They have selected you based on your marks or scores in your bachelor's degree or your GATE score, your GRE score or whatever the case may be. But now they are going to ask you questions. So do not act like you know too many things. Do not say that you are a topper in GATE. Do not say that you have a perfect score in GRE and so on. They already know that. So focus on answering the questions you are asked and don't let this come out at any point. Now finally, a very important bonus question and this is often a trick question for many candidates is that most of the professors who are interviewing master's degree students, 
they are themselves PhDs and they are professors. So they may ask you questions like, why do you want to do a master's degree? Now the correct answer to this question is that you want to do a master's degree to gain more knowledge, to become an expert in the field. You have certain lacunas in your bachelor's degree preparation which you want to fulfill and so on. Don't say things like, I want to do a master's degree because I did not get a job or I did not get master's, uh, I did not get a job and so I want to spend some time doing a master's degree to prepare for some further exam and so on. So these of course may be the truth but they come across very negatively. So always try to make a positive frame of mind in terms of answering any question. So essentially your aim of doing an MTech degree should be in general to learn more things to develop some research mindset and get some training in research and then to get a better job or to go and do something else. Now one more question you are likely to be asked is would you like to do a PhD following the MTech degree. Now here an interesting answer is that you should uh, say that um, you have the option in mind you are going to think about it at the end of your MTech degree or during the MTech degree because most of the professors would like you to do a PhD. So it's not a good idea to say that you have no interest in PhD at this point because that again comes across as a negative viewpoint. And if you have a negative viewpoint on certain things at this stage, that affects the way you conduct yourself as a student during your MTech phase and so on. And so you may not be considered the most optimal candidate for that particular university. So again, keep the option clear. You are going to do the MTech degree to learn a lot of knowledge, to learn many new things, to learn new subjects from professors at this new university. And then if you get more interested in research, you are going to go ahead and do a PhD degree. That should be the way you start your graduate school. It may lead somewhere else, but that's the thing you should say. And that's the thing you should have in mind at this stage. So these were some ideas I had for you regarding the master's degree interview process at many institutions which are focused on research and several of these are useful for PhD interviews also but I will make a separate video on that because their research aspects will become more important. So I hope you benefit from this video and I will see you soon in a new video. See you then.